Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Guillermo Sabatia, your host on Perspectives on Energy here at Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, and uh, today we'll be talking about the role of natural gas in the energy transition. So uh, again, I am uh, I am the Director of Inter International Services for HSI, the Health and Safety Institute, where we train uh, grid operators on how to handle everything grid related. So, so uh, today we'll talk a little bit more on the role of natural gas in this energy transition and and uh, and uh, going to be referencing a few of the um, the uh, capacity assessment reports from uh, NERC, the NERC, which is the North American Electric Liability uh, Corporation, and uh, very interesting information on there. And uh, one thing I want to make sure up front that we understand that uh, according to them, we are we are relatively fine for summer of 2023 and the beginnings of the of the end of the year towards the winter of 2023. So, uh, so far, when it comes to uh, capacity, capacity assessment, um, and everything that we're looking at, in this case, we should be having adequate, not, not just uh, megawatt supply, but also adequate amount of fuel when it comes to uh, natural gas. I'm sure most of you have already known that the majority of the portfolios out there uh, they usually run, a lot of them have a lot of natural gas uh, running resources, whether it's a dual fuel type of uh, generating site or it's a combined cycle, uh, two, com two combustion turbines and one HERSIG, or you have, for example, a simple cycle combustion turbine that are used for peaking. Either way, that um, gas supply, according to NERC, seems to be in good order coming up for the throughout this year, especially now that we've got these like... Uh, Quite a quite a, a lot of these problems with the heat and load forecasting, and we've been setting uh, heat records day after day after day across this country. So uh, definitely something that could impact, for example, uh, our consumption of natural gas in a lot of these resources, right? And of course, in the winter, it becomes even more severe because not only are you uh, competing with um, not additional resources for those resources to be able to do use heating in the houses and in industrial and in businesses. But also you have some challenges when it comes to transporting the that fuel, right? When it comes to natural gas and those pipelines. So yeah, so looking at the NERC 2023 summer reliability assessment uh, that came out back in May of 2023, and uh, it just it, it everybody looks to be in adequately good shape. Uh, some of them have a, a seasonal risk assessment summary, uh, which is elevated. You know, they have the potential for operating reserves. In above normal condition and that that's consistent with the fact that you know you have higher than normal temperatures and again you lose uh one or two generators you are likely going to experience some some kind of load shedding possibly right but uh for the for the most part there's no i haven't seen any high high uh risk uh, assessment areas in the in the u.s which is great news right um uh, last year, year before, we were seeing a different, uh, things were painting a different picture regarding that, right? So um, just great news in this case, right? When it comes to uh, electric supply, we should be able to meet our our uh, forecasted load uh, for the rest of the year uh, in spite of this heat that we're experiencing and even what we expect to see in this winter. The other nice aspect of this is that there was the regulation put in place uh, and uh, to be able to better manage uh, winter operations for some of these like generators. Same things happening with some of the um, gas pipeline suppliers. So again, a lot, a lot of safeguards and that's usually, uh, I believe was a uh, storm uh, Yuri and the other winter storm that we had that affected the ERCOT region, right? And then some other areas in the Midwest. So with that in mind, um, you saw quite a bit of changes given the winter capabilities of some of these facilities, whether it's generation or the delivery of gas, right? So the only challenge that they normally would see would have been the delivery of gas in this case, right? Whether you have a constraint in the pipeline, don't have enough supply, or you're you're not you're running out of that supply at some point because either there was a damage uh, that that occurred to those uh, those pipelines, or there was a lot more usage than was expected. Of course, mind you, a lot of this um, fuel supply is arranged for in advance 
So that is usually a forecast and there's usually a firm contract in place. They got non-firm contracts, just like you see, for example, in transmission space, but uh, the same thing happens with these pipelines. Um, but that uh, for this year, uh, NERC feels pretty co comfortable, uh, pretty confident that we should, we should be fine. Uh, the long-term uh, forecast with the next five years, uh, not so much. You see a lot more of the uh, elevated risk in a lot of different regions, namely uh, WEC, for example, has some areas that are in definite risk as well, and uh, some areas in the Northeast and some areas in the North, right? So that's over the next four or five years. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they have a lot of what they call premature retirements of base load generation. And that could be natural gas, nuclear, it can be even coal, right? So in these instances, right, you're going to see that base load generation uh, they're retiring it early. They're replacing it with uh, renewables. Uh, the problem with that is that um, you know, any one of these baseload units can usually have an 85% availability for uh, some of these renewables. In some cases, they have wind, for example. Some of them have 15, 20% availability, depending on how consistent that that wind blow is, um, that wind forecast is throughout the year. O other areas, for example, some solar have maybe 40 to 50%. So in this case, right, you can't count on that capacity uh, for that particular uh, peak, uh, which is why you, you, you need to have some of that base load generation. So uh, as we have more and more of these like premature retirements for these uh, coal generators, which, you know, we have uh, cl climate um, climate goals to meet and 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 meets our certain emission need requirements. This problem now, you know, is exacerbated by the fact that the majority of these sites are either repowered to be able to burn natural gas, or they are uh, they will go ahead and install, for example, a uh, combustion turbine or a peaker that runs on natural gas as well. So this in itself presents a, a, it's an opportunity to be able to meet that load for this variability. But at the same time, right, uh, you're dependent on that supply to me. And uh, as more, you can, we're going to see more and more of this, uh, these types of facilities commissioned, you may begin to see a problem or when it comes to constraints with supply, or if not enough pipelines are being, uh, being uh, built and uh, put into service, right? So uh, that's that's the challenge at this time, um, given the fact that you know we're seeing different things, and, and you have two different priorities that that really are inter interrelated, and they also affect each other very very dramatically. One of them is to have you know very important climate goals that we need to achieve, but of course you know we can't be the only ones in the world retiring coal plants while. Uh, countries like China and uh, other parts of, of the industrialized developing world are putting new coal plants online at, at a rate that's faster than the ones that we shut down. So that's definitely a problem, right? Um, putting ourselves into a position of uh, reduced reliability to meet these, these climate goals, while at the same time, these other countries are not abiding by, by any of those. And their, their main goal is just make sure they have enough electricity to meet their industrial needs without any any concern at all with the environment. So that becomes a challenge right for us as well. So uh given those challenges, I mean of course that that um for us one of those ways to meet those is is again the transitional fuel, right? It becomes natural gas. It's amongst one of the cleanest of all the fossil fuels. I remember in, in my day back in the early 2000s where you know we were getting away from oil uh here in Florida and uh, replaced everything with natural gas pretty much and um, that made a huge difference when it came when it came to emissions and uh, we got from we we were one of the biggest consumers of of oil to actually not consuming any oil at all for that utility in florida so it was a pretty uh, impressive feat to go ahead and do that but it required having having a fleet that was mostly run on natural gas so then the soft presents a problem right so, uh, and that's the whole thing, right? Uh, making this transition from you know, very dirty fossil fuels to to emission-free uh, energy resources or renewable resources will require, for example, something to transition over. Um, until we see, for example, SMRs or more hydro or, or more of these facilities that are clean but dispatchable, uh, you're going to need a, something to be able to, to help you in this transition. Batteries, great to have those, but you know, three, four, five hours and then at the cost per, per installed, 
for a solid megawatt, they're just not there right now, right? And the fact that, you know, you may have four or five days, six days of weather where you're unable to charge or you don't have enough wind or your batteries won't be able to uh, give you that supplemental backup, right? As, as you as you could get from a baseload unit that's dispatchable and always available. So um, SMRs, they're saying the earliest is 2029. 20, and again, an SMR is a small budget of reactor. But so until then, right, we're, we're going to have to rely on, on some of these combustion turbines or some of these combined cycle plants that are running natural gas. And which, you know, is, is at least something we have plenty of. And we have the infrastructure in place to be able to transport that fuel from one, from the source to, to the delivery point. Challenge there, of course, is uh, availability. And uh, even, for example, cybersecurity, cyber attack, or even infrastructure uh, breakdowns, right? So keeping that in mind, right, from my perspective, uh, how do we train operators to be able to manage, for example, a grid where your generation has to um, mitigate changes, whether you're running, you're dispatching a balancing authority, your generators that have uh, either renewables, you're running uh, combined cycle plants that run gas, you're, you're, or you're, you're running baseload generation. And in some places now you're even dispatching nuclear plants day ahead, which uh, I thought I never thought I would you know see this in my career, but yet here we are, we're dispatching nuclear plants day ahead, which is, you know, that's in response to uh, load forecast and this renewable variability, which, you know, I'm glad to see we the industry uh, pivot was able to pivot and adapt. But again, this has its own costs and its own uh, maintenance and maintenance nightmares, as you can imagine, right? That, that changes the actual price dynamic for every megawatt produced by those generating facilities. And then, of course, if you're displacing nuclear to accommodate uh, renewables, then that also changes the overall price of your system, right? That Lambda price is different based on that. So as an operator, right, what we do to train in this case, right? Well, well, one of the things that I think is a permanent drill, is a very, very important drill to be able to run, of course, is to simulate a um, loss of fuel scenario. Whether you have your pipelines, for example, a compromise, you have a cyber attack, or there's something happened the weather-wise, which we've already seen happen in, in, in some of our regions, right? So one of the things to actually accomplish there is to actually have the operators train, have the plants individually train on doing a fuel swap. In a lot of cases, most of these facilities, most, not all, tend to have uh, liquid fuel storage on site, which allows them to run maybe several hours. I mean, uh, most of the ones that I've seen had the capacity to be able to run maybe three or four days of full load. So that was rather an interesting, uh, I guess, um, asset to be able to manage in that case because then you're given that ability the challenges when swapping fuels uh usually you you don't get much of a much of a warning you may have maybe a couple of hours of warning if you see it coming sometimes you don't you may have maybe a half hour warning based on the fact that you know you're, you're either losing supply or you've had a problem with the, the pipeline so in, th in this case right the system operator or the grid operator for example needs to be well trained on how to manage those changes and uh, that's something that in my um, in my previous job uh, we were able to actually do that as as uh, one of our one of our simulation drills was to actually get the operators um, familiar with the process of uh, of a of a system wide fuel swap depending on where you had a a failure in the pipeline or if you had lost all your all your uh, supply so that was a very interesting challenge. In fact, they, we already had a scenario at one point where real time, you know, we couldn't run everything on natural gas. You had to either uh, pick one or the other, and you had to actually change some of the fuel mix that will go into that facility. So they were pretty much getting a lot of that um, you know, real time in, the, in, the, in, that, in that particular system. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, they had, uh, and I'm sorry about the background noise, we've got a thunderstorm here tonight. So anyway, so that is Florida after all. So anyway, so then we were um, practicing on the challenges, right? When, when it comes to doing a fuel swap, and again, it's it's most of these facilities are able to do their fuel swap on site. They can usually they have rehearsed it enough real time that they can actually do it, and it seems pretty seamless. And they will go from gas to liquid fuel, and uh, they would just simply take it off automatic generation control. They will hold it at a, at a steady load, maybe back down. But in most cases, they will just keep it at the same load level and just swap fuel. 
and then and then you were just running again. Mind you, you would see a uh, you will see a definite change in the price because liquid fuels are a little more it's quite a bit more expensive than natural gas. And right about now we're looking at three point three and a half. Uh, between three and four dollars per uh, mm BTUs is the price right now as as we're, as we're going through the summer. So not a, not that expensive. I used to see it somewhere in the teens at some point. So quite a big difference. But um, right. So in that particular process, right, simulating that in the system, that becomes really important, right, to get operators ready to be able to re respond whenever there is a fuel crisis. So um, that's one thing to expect, right? So so so. Uh, Mild review here. So as a as a transition fuel, right, when it comes to going from uh, these fossil fuels, a majority of fossil fuels, or actually replacing some of these coal-fired plants, replacing oil burning plants, or replacing aging infrastructure, right, specifically these older combined cycle plants, you're still going to need natural gas to be able to get you to the point where either SMRs um, are available uh, or we commission more of those facilities or we have a, a different resource that, that becomes available or or like batteries are uh, a lot a lot more uh, widely distributed. Or you may even see, for example, the advent of distributed energy resources that uh, actually on their own become quite the resource that, are, that most of the utilities can go ahead and dispatch. But the likelihood of that happening in the next four or five years is not very high. Most likely you're going to need, for example, having a... Uh, quite the mix, right? You're going to have renewables. You're going to have an increasing number of renewables, but at some point, right, you're dealing with uh, inverter-based resources and all the um, interesting behaviors that they that they exhibit whenever you have a fault on on on, on the system, especially somewhere near those resources. So definitely, you will need to have, for example, base load, and a lot of that base load for for, for now is going to. Uh, be in the form of combined cycle plants that are running um, natural gas and then peaking units that are going to be, of course, simple cycle combustion uh, turbines that are also running a natural gas, all of them with uh, liquid fuel backup, right? And uh, seems to be the most reliable feature at this time, the least, um, defi definitely the, the lowest carbon footprint compared to oil or definitely coal. And, um, you, but, you know, you still might see uh, quite a bit of technology using carbon capture in a lot of these places where they just can't retire th these plants given the um, reliability requirements of that area and that, that grid topology. Right? So again, um, that's, that's the, uh, the, su the, the supply challenge. The other one, of course, is getting natural gas to these sites. Um, now, you know, I would love nothing more to see uh, quite a mixed portfolio of uh, generation resources, whether you have some more nuclear, some new hydro, some other types of resources, you know, not just renewables, right, but then also the uh, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, and that sort of thing that also will be a great um, addition to, to the fleet. Problem is with that right now is we can't put a we can't put like like an accurate price on it where these utilities can actually make a long term forecast and go ahead and uh, make that capital investment on this technology that isn't even proven yet right so um, definitely it's uh, as as an industry we're very like source agnostic we we don't care where you get your 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 energy from as as long as it's reliable, cost effective, and then of course you know it's it's a safe, and then and, and, and then uh, that would also meet these these uh, zero carbon emission goals, right? So and the final thing I wanted to like re remind everyone, of course, is is as we go into this uh, transition where we retire more of these like uh, base load units where it's coal or nuclear, we might see a whole lot more of these uh, facilities either being repowered or replaced probably in the same location uh, with combined cycle plants, whether it's a site repowering, whether they're replacing all these boilers and all these different uh, uh, older generation coal and oil with the um, brand new combined cycle site for a larger generator, or you might see a lot more of these uh, CTs uh, popping up everywhere, especially where there's a conveniently located site where they have natural gas. Right? So that is what you're looking at. And of course, you know, train, 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 train your operators on how to, uh, how to dispatch the fleet, and the more importantly, how to dispatch it in, in light of a, a fuel shortage. So they, they need to do a, a swap. And then, of course, if that doesn't work, and you do have a problem where you're losing generation because you've lost fuel and the swap was, on, and was not successful, then, of course, that would require um, 
taking other emergency measures up to and including the shedding of load, which usually comes by in the form of feeder rotation, right? So um, that's the different things that we're looking at. And But then again, the raw natural gas, of course, will be a present one. And we got quite a quite a large supply of that in, 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 in this country and in Canada. So I guess with that, we're in good shape. And in fact, we can probably remain being a net exporter of that resource for 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 the foreseeable future. So anyway, so okay, so that is all I have for tonight. I uh, thank you so much for uh, watching. Uh, have any comments? Please go ahead and uh, like, subscribe, or and then leave comments down below, and I'll try my best to respond. And then, then again, thank you again for uh, uh, viewing Think Tech Hawaii uh, Perspectives on Energy. Thank you, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.